My name is, is Carl Young Christian Roth, um, like Pastor Eric said, and I'm here teaching and, and part of the, the team here at the church. And um, we've also been, had the joy of launching um, the Gospel Coalition together with Pastor Conrad and Eric here in the Nordics. And um, yeah, it's been a great day today. It is. It's a birthday. It was a celebration. So thank you for, for sharing that. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you, FIBC, for those of you here and at home and, and just who have been praying for us, who've been partnering and serving in, di in different ways. Um, this will be the last time you'll see me, actually, for a while. I'm going to be traveling to the U.S. Um, for various reasons. Um, Stephanie will be here more. more but um, So I just wanted to take this moment to say thank you. Thank you so much for really birthing a new church. So praise the Lord. Um, thank you for your faithfulness to him and what he's doing in you and in us. Um, I'll be back. Um, we've already got it in the schedule. We're going to be back in, in, in the fall. And, um, but it's been, it's been a, great, a great time together in this season. So um, our subject today, like Pastor Eric alluded to, is the warring desires within every human heart. Uh, the struggle to live a life of goodness and holiness when our, our natures are pulling us down into the muck and the mire of sin and struggle. The Bible, I think, is extremely realistic about, like what we sang in Psalm 90, the struggle, the fight to believe, to wake up every day and place our hope. I think it's often the caricature of Christians in the media that we're kind of this out of touch um, with reality, sort of pie in the sky, you know, privileged, easy for you to say, hunky-dory kind of attitude the world has to us. But the Bible is clear from start to finish. I don't know if you've read the Old Testament lately, but it's not, it's not always that ch child-friendly. It's not this sanitized thing, right? You read the Psalms, you, you hear the struggle, and the Bible is clear that there is this struggle. This, But why talk about this? Why talk about the struggle of human existence and the sense of, of division that we might have in our own hearts? Um, for one, because I think in some ways we're all dealing with that, especially right now. Amen? Um, it seems like all the movies that I see these days are about the end of the world in some way or another, right? It's like apocalypse this, apocalypse that. The struggle of humanity to survive. But also there's always these ethical questions like, are we going to eat each other or not, right? Like there's all these like ethical, like there's this struggle and people are talking about this even more so now with this war in Ukraine. We're all imagining these horror scenarios across Europe, asking ourselves like, what would we do? I mean, what would you do if you were told to, to stay and make Molotov cocktails while your wife and kids had to leave? What would you do, man? Would you be able to stand for what's right and stick to your moral compass? Or, or might you compromise in the midst of death, chaos, struggle to survive? I mean, this is a question worth asking. It's a, it's a timely, timely time to come to this text in Romans 7. And I think if we're honest, we can say, that we would struggle. We would be in a similar situation. We would feel, we all do at various times, feel divided in our loyalties. So let's dive into this text and look at what Paul has to say. I'll read um, from Romans chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them. And then I'll pray. 14 to 20. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For if I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. 
God, I pray now as we look at this text together, I pray that you would give us eyes to see. I pray that your voice would be clear. I pray that, pray that the, the scripture would illuminate us. I pray that you would uh, comfort us, give us uh, uh, reassurance, but also hope in this text. I pray, Father, above all else, that, that, um, that you would keep your word central. I pray that you would keep the gospel, keep Christ central. Father, anything that I do now or even that we do here today without the guidance of your spirit is for nothing. It's for naught. Lord, we believe that with all whole hearts. So I pray for the congregation now as well as we, as we gather under your word, Lord God, that you would make our, our hearts soft and supple and receptive to what you're saying. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I've got three ideas from the text today. Um, Pastor Eric keeps telling me I need to do the, I'm going to do this right. So we've got three ideas. Division, decision, desire. So that's left to right, right? D -d -d division, decision, desire. I finally got it right, right before I leave for a while, yeah? So division, decision, desire. So division, first of all, Paul says here, the law of God leads to division in our minds, in, in Christian minds, I will say, wanting to do what's right, but not being able to. Okay? So look at verse 14 and 15, if you would, where we see this principle. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for, what I, do, for I, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. So, there's this divided man in the text, right? It's using the Greek word ego, I. Seems like Paul is talking. Most people agree Paul is talking, but, but what exactly is Paul envisioning here? Who is the divided man, okay? Uh, this is a hotly debated issue, and Pastor Eric referred to it last week. Um, some think this describes Paul actually as a non-Christian Jew, an unregenerate unsaved person. Some think this describes Adam. Kind of, he's thinking way back to Adam. But others just think this describes Christian experience. And maybe you can guess from my introduction, and I think Pastor Eric even alluded to it last week, my interpretation is that this is Christian experience. And I think it's kind of cool, actually, Pastor Eric and I have different perspectives on this, but you know, if we had more time to talk through it, maybe it would, would, would have ended up actually agreeing. We just kind of got to our preparation. We're like, oh, okay. Because the thing is, there's respected people on both sides of this issue. Very respected people. Douglas Moo, who's a commentator that we've been using a lot uh, in this sermon series. He agrees with Pastor Eric. Tom Schreiner agrees with me. You know, and there's all these things like, but the point of this passage overall is clear anyway. And that's why we think it's okay to have diversity. We can be respectful. We can have agree to disagree on this. Because the main point of chapter 7 remains the same. The topic he's taping, taking up is the law. And he's arguing clearly that the law is not the problem. Sin is the problem. Okay? And he's saying that just like we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, we grow in Christ by grace alone, through faith alone. The law reveals the problem, which is why we need so much more grace. That is the point. And the point of this passage is driving towards the end of the chapter. And to quote my good friend, and Arnie knows him too, Tim Savage, uh, in a book, The Good Life, he says that the end of the chapter... Verse 24, we see that the point of this passage is actually not to make us feel bad and to make us think, oh, I'm so sinful and I'm so terrible and woe is me. The point is to get us on to chapter 8 where it says there is now no condemnation. And if you look at verse 24 and 25, there's a statement. You guys have probably heard it. If you've read Romans before, it's very famous. It says, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's the point of this passage. We're driving toward the end where Paul says, I am helpless. I am desperate. And then there's no break. It's the two clauses in the same sentence. Praise be to Christ. 
He has delivered me. Praise be to him. That's the point of this text. The point is the hope is not in us. The hope is in Christ. Okay? It's not to make us feel guilty. It's not to get down on us. It's to show us that we need Jesus from the start to the finish. So, but my perspective is that this is a Christian experience. Okay? So how do I know that? How do I know it's a Christian? Christian? How do you know it's a Christian? Christian? Because I would say the main reason is that if this is an unregenerate non-Christian, it doesn't move Paul's argument forward. When you're reading, especially the, the letters of the New Testament, there's usually kind of an argument building. It's a very propositional language, and it's kind of moving it forward, right? So Paul spends the first two chapters a lot about sinful humanity and even Judaism there in chapter 2, right? And then he goes on to the gospel, of, the gospel of justification by faith, being saved, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. And he does take up some of these other matters of the law in passing, but, but then he transitions into a whole section, I believe, starting in chapter 6, talking about sanctification, talking about Christian life, talking about walking with Christ and growing in Christ. And then everyone also agrees that in chapter 8, He's taking up life in the spirit. He's taking up life in Christ as opposed to life in the flesh, right? So for me, for Paul, and actually Doug Moo, he admits this, it's kind of a weird aside if it's not a Christian in chapter 7. And my argument is, I don't think that's what Paul's doing. I think he's taking an aside to address the law in Christian life. He's continuing his line of thought. But let me just say, there is a more experiential reason. There's a more practical reason. And, th and this is, I've been talking with this with some of the people at New Song, and, and this is, I think, a lot of times where, where at least some of us guys were like, when we read this, we're like, yeah, yeah, that's my, that's my experience. <laughs> like, I don't know about you guys, but like, and, and again, I'm not saying that Pastor Eric thinks this or other people think this necessarily, but I just think this is the practical side of it, is that we see Christian experience here. Because I think the alternative it is to say that this is not Christian experience. And, and I think that can be challenging. J.I. Packer um, is a great, respected evangelical. He wrote Knowing God. He wrote significantly on this passage. And he was being uh, educated in England. Um, he's just died recently. He's an older, died in his 80s or 90s. So it was a while ago in London as a young student. And there was these movements happening at that time, um, amongst them kind of a version of Pentecostalism, some, some kind of Wesleyanism, and also um, this thing called Keswick, Keswick theology movement, which I think there's like, none of these things are defined by that anymore. So just don't, I'm not throwing all those things out. I'm just saying at that time, there was this movement and they were all kind of teaching the same thing, that there was this thing called sanctification by faith or baptism in the spirit or something like that. They use different words for it, but they all kind of had a similar message. The message was you get to this point in Christianity after you're saved where you don't struggle anymore, where you just kind of, you can kind of put things on cruise control. You know, if you call it cruise control here, cruise control, that's an American thing. Yeah. Um, where you aren't tempted much, if at all. And his experience as a young man in college was like, he actually had these experiences in different ways, in different mo movements. And he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm now I'm sanctified by faith. I'm, I'm there. I'm at that point. I had the experience. But then he gets back into his daily life and he looks into his heart. He looks into his motives and he's like, I'm, str I'm still struggling. <laughs> I'm still divided. When I wake up in the morning, it's still a struggle to be satisfied in God as the sun comes up. And he said he found himself wanting to kind of fit in with these movements to the point where, where he was just being hypocritical. He wasn't being honest about his struggle. And he said he tried like two or three different times to follow these teachings, but he just couldn't do it. And he came to the point where he says, no, Romans 7, that is... Christian experience. He actually wrote at length academically about it as well. And I just think it's important that we realize that, that we don't reach perfection. And I know Pastor Eric would agree with that for sure, that there's not this state of, like, the Christian life is not this trite, chipper 
thing where the winners just keep winning. It is a struggle to be satisfied in Christ. And, and Martin Luther said it like this, you, you shave sin off, like sin, like fighting sin is like shaving. You shave here, and if you just keep shaving here, you think you're good, but then it's like, then it starts growing here, you know? It's like, oh no, now you gotta start shaving there, and now it's growing here, you know? Um, there is a division in our hearts, okay? So that's the first point. The second point is decision. Decision, division, decision. And that is Christians sometimes, maybe often even, still choose to do wrong because of indwelling sin. Indwelling sin is the key term there. Let's look at verse 16, 17, and then also in verse 20. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. And then in verse 20, Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells within me. And I think that's the key. Our identity is not doing these things in Christ. We are set free from sin. But what is there? There's this thing still in us, sin that dwells within me. And that's why we still choose sometimes. It doesn't define us, but we make these decisions. And the overarching purpose in chapter 7 is to show that the law is not treated as sin by Paul. That's not the result of his teaching on justification by faith. So why show it in this way? Doesn't it doesn't it seem like a strange way to defend Paul's view of the law by showing an example of, of someone like really struggling? Right? Isn't that a strange way? But I think what Paul is pointing to is that the reason they cannot follow the law is not the law's fault. That's what he's saying. That's where he lands in verse 20. He says, the law is not the problem. It is. What is it? It's sin that dwells within me. So, that again, this doesn't mean that the Christian life is just this constant, like, terrible life of, 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 of sin and, and struggle. Like, it's not the overarching narrative of the Christian life, but rather that there is an indwelling sinful nature that may become subverted when we're born again, but it's not ever removed. It's still there. It is the very body that we have. Is the divided man in this passage, I want to ask this question. Is, is Paul like saying he's not responsible? <laughs> it kind of sounds like that, doesn't it? It sounds like he's saying, if, if I agree in my heart that, I'm not, that I don't want to sin, then it's not me who does it. Is that, is that what he's saying? He's saying, oh, I'm not, it's not me who's doing it. That's kind of what it sounds like, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> Quite the opposite. He's actually saying, he's putting his sinful nature in opposition to God's perfect law. He's saying, it's not the law that's the problem. It's my sinful nature. It's this thing within me. You see, we all have this temptation, don't we? We have a temptation to blame God's structure, his design, his rules, his law for our sin. Maybe, what, what, what does this look like in your life? At work, maybe there's a new software system and you've been there for two decades and it's like, really? Another software system? I have to learn all these rules again. If they just would not change the rules, then I would be able to be a good employee. Then I would respect my boss because, you know, they're always just, they're just like this. They're just, they're such a big hierarchy and hegemony. And no, that's the circumstance. But what's prompting our disrespect for our employers? What's prompting our, our anger towards our coworkers? That's not the system that's causing that. That's our sin. That's the decisions that we make. And there is a freedom from that. There's a freedom from the obligation to be 
under the law in Christ. There's a freedom from that. So that's the second point, decisions. Decisions. Division, decision. And the third point here is desire. Everybody say desire. Okay, good. Thank you. I felt like it was getting subdued. I want to make sure everybody's still awake, so that's good. Um, desire. The Christian's desire to do what is right, it says here, is not enough to enable him or her to do it. It's not enough to enable him or her to do it. Look at verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For if I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Sorry, I said if. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. In my mind, this is the main reason that this is talking about a Christian. Like, without Jesus and without the Holy Spirit, like, the world doesn't have any reason to desire to do what's right. I mean, maybe in different religions, that sort of thing. But, but basically, the way the Bible talks about unregenerate people, it says that no one seeks God, no one desires goodness. So no one wants to do what is good, to love God with all their heart, soul, and mind and strength. That's the essence of the law, it says in the Old Testament, right? Love your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And we shouldn't expect them to. <laughs> but what Paul is saying here is that he desires to do that. But what is, the, what is he getting at with this point? What, 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 is, what is the main question here? It's the main question he's raising in chapter 7. Does the gospel of justification by faith mean that we make the law useless or sinful? And Paul says no, because it is the sin remaining in us. And that sin, what is it doing? It's using the opportunity of the law to push us further in, to prompt, to inflame our desire in the wrong way. You see, indwelling sin is a reality for all of us. It's a reality that we cannot get away from. It's a reality that we have to face. We have to put it to death. Amen? We have to be killing sin or sin will be killing us. The, the desire to do what's right is not enough. We have to be putting that desire to death by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And I think some of us struggle. We struggle because we think, man, I'm not a super Christian. You know, I can't get up there and preach. I, I, I'm not like... Pastor Eric, I don't have my life, you know, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not exemplary maybe in various ways or to be honest, I have, I have these things that I'm struggling with, okay? And, and I'm not saying get used to that and just keep coddling those sins, but be encouraged by the fact that it is a war. It is a struggle. And the reformers of which we Baptists and, and, and Pro Protestants are derived, they are the ones that brought this back and said, the problem with the church when it was getting corrupt is that it was saying you had to have this outward performance. And if you don't feel like you can perform, then here are other ways for us to assuage your conscience. But Calvin, he said, no. He said, Christians are like infants crawling through the mud slowly. What does that mean? It means we're making progress just very slowly. <laughs> And while we're doing it, there's mud all over us, right? Um, Martin Luther had this experience around the time that he converted. He realized that he didn't just need to repent of all the sins that he did. He realized that the whole process of repentance that he was taking on, his motives were wrong. He was trying to justify himself. He was trying to perform for God. So what did he have to do? And I remember when I first realized this. Those of you who maybe are studying theology or whatever, you, you, you start reading Luther and this, when you realize this, your, your mind kind of explodes. Mine did anyway. Oh, I need to repent of my repentance. I need to repent of the good things I do. I need to repent of the church that I planted this morning. What? Because, because 
I'm not loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm not. I never am. I can't go a day without sinning. Amen? And guess what? That's good news. Because we're not just saved by grace. We grow by grace. Okay? And guess what? Good news. You're worse off than you imagine. That's good news. Why is that good news? Because that means we don't have to play a game with God or with each other. We don't have to try to convince ourselves that we're okay or that we're perfect. But realize that we as Christians are never going to make it. We will in heaven. Right? We'll stumble into the kingdom and it'll be wonderful. Amen? And we will be remade. But guess what? Until that comes, Jesus is going to keep forgiving us not just when we get saved, but every day of our lives. Amen? Not just our big mistakes, like when we sleep around or have an abortion or cheat on our college entrance exams. All of those are big sins, right? He says he'll forgive us in the small ways we fall short, which are also big. Okay? Um, this is good news. And we can sin. When we, when, we, when, we, when we feel ourselves sinning, Martin Luther said sin boldly. And you have to be careful saying that. So I'm going to explain it because people take him out of context. But what he means is don't be afraid of the fact that you're a sinner. Don't be afraid of the fact that you're not who you one day will be. Embrace that and repent. The first of Martin Luther's 99, I'm quoting Luther a lot now, I'm sorry. It's because, you know, that's what happens when you're studying the Reformation and stuff. Um, the first of his 99 theses that he, that he banked on the, the Witten, Wittenberg door was all of life is repentance. All of life is repentance in Christ. So, again, all these points are nice. Desire, decision, division. What is the main point that stands? It's where this chapter is heading. Who can deliver me from this body of death? Amen? Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. And that answer is the same for you today, if you come to Christ right now, maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you're here for the first time. Maybe you're listening in. Come to Jesus because it's, it's not a, a religion that says you have to get it together and do the five spiritual laws. Like there is grace. It's all of grace. We are a hospital of sinners, not a museum of relics. Amen, saints? Amen. So come to him and be saved. But you know what? That's the same message for you if you come today and are saved for those of you who have been walking with Jesus for 30 years thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord who will deliver us from our bodies of death and we will say that the day we walk into the grave one thing that I struggle with, we're talking about struggle today in my walk with Christ, I've alluded to this before, is that it's hard for me to stay consistent in prayer. But even getting up in the morning and reading the word, and I think a part of that reason is because um, I'm, I'm sometimes when I have a really good time with the Lord and in the word, it doesn't make my life easier. Now, why am I saying that? Because I think it's, it's kind of what Paul's getting at here. The law, like I read the law of God and it's not like all of a sudden my day is now like I'm successful and I'm relaxed and I'm like, no, actually now my conscience is more aware. The Holy Spirit is at work in me, making me more sensitive and making me want to move towards others and love and serve them, which makes me want to do more things. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like there's this struggle. Like, it's not just a struggle to actually do the things of walking with Christ. That's true, too. But actually, like, it doesn't get easier when I'm obedient necessarily, right? And I'm, I'm, the truth is, the problem is not God's word, right? It's that indwelling sin within me. It's that anxiety. It's that desire to justify myself. But let me just ask you this. Are you, are you struggling? I've had messages from at least two or three people in the last couple of weeks that are struggling and these are healthy, young, successful people. Not, not all of them young and successful, but some of them at least. And, they're, and we live in Denmark. I mean, the irony, I think, is continually pointed out that we live in the happiest, healthiest, wealthiest part of the world. And yet, you read the new psychology studies from last week. Anxiety, stress, 
We're struggling. Amen? Are you burdened by this war that's happening and struggling with the weight of it all? Does the law of God not seem good and holy and righteous to you? Guess what? That's part of the package. Come to Jesus and you can find peace. But it doesn't mean the struggle is going to end. So I would encourage you to come to him and rest in him. And know that in him there is a promise of rest. There is a hope in the struggle. There is a joy that undergirds it all. Um, that is the gospel. He promises not a perfect life. He does, it doesn't promise a lack of struggle. He promises himself. He promises rest in him, in his kingdom. So I encourage you to, to fight for that. And that will never depart from you. Amen? Let me pray. God, we, uh, we thank you for, for your truth. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the promises that we have in you that, that there is ironically a rest in you that cannot be taken. And yet, Lord God, we struggle to believe it. We struggle each morning to be satisfied in you. So we pray, Lord God, that we would do that. We pray that, that you would take us from here. And it can be confusing to look at a passage like this, God, but we thank you that it's there. We thank you for the honesty of your word. We thank you. And we thank you above all else for the promise that, that, there, that there is no condemnation, that Jesus will deliver us one day. Um, we pray for those of us who are going from here into families and jobs that are stressful and chaotic. And I pray that, that you would bring us hope in the midst of that struggle. You would remind us that the struggle is designed by you for our joy and your glory. All of it is, Lord God. You have a plan. You are sovereign. You are over it all. So we love you, Lord God. We thank you again for today. We pray that you would close our time in fellowship and worship for your name's sake, Jesus. Amen.